What I want to think about this, this evening is something to do with materialism and materiality. But I think before I get to that, I need to think again about uh, well, what I'm kind of positioning as its opposite, which is uh, spirituality, which isn't a great opposite, but it'll do for now. The reason why I want to use that as an opposite is because it's a term, as I think I've mentioned before, it's, uh, it's one that I have a lot of problems with. I keep coming across it. It seems to be a word that's used more and more in, and in many different contexts than perhaps it used to be five years ago even. Uh, but I don't know what it means. I don't uh, feel comfortable using it. So uh, as a way of kind of exercising that discomfort, um, I'm thinking about it quite a lot to see if I can find ways to make it useful for me, to make it work. Uh, and one of the things that I'm finding, certainly in a lot of the videos that I'm watching and the things that I'm reading about, is that, well, certain things about spirituality. First, that the term seems to have genuinely wider application than perhaps it used to. Now, that might just be a function of my placing my attention on it, so I'm noticing it more. But I, I think it has a wider application than perhaps it had. Certainly, uh, different constituencies of people seem to be using it. Politicians would never use the term spirituality, certainly in British politics, five or ten years ago, and now it's relatively commonplace. Uh, I don't know, and I've come across it in things like business and management books, and um, oh, a whole range of different things. Way away from something like religious context, which is where perhaps I would have uh, expected to find it more. So that's the first thing I'm noticing about it, that it has a wider set of applications, perhaps. Uh, and the other thing, which in, in a way is more interesting from my perspective, is to do with, uh, related to that thing, you know, what, what the commonalities are amongst these different, uh, these different disciplines, these different areas of practice, and the kind of uh, cognate ideas that sit alongside spirituality within those disciplines. So, for example, of course, I'm seeing spirituality applied to, within a religious context, to something like the soul, or something like God, uh, something like divine, uh, yeah, some kind of divinity, of course, that's what you would expect. Uh, but elsewhere, I'm seeing it applied to something like purpose, for example. And here I'm thinking about the purpose-driven life, that book by, um, I can't get his name now, it'll come back to me. Uh, but the idea of purpose, in particular something called, you might call higher purpose, playing with a vertical metaphor there, but uh, something to do with purpose as being spiritual. Uh, calling something to do with calling, which is related to spirituality. And here I'm reminded of James Hillman's book on the, called The Soul's Code, which is subtitled In Search of Character and Calling. So again, there's a kind of spiritual... Um, you know, the language of spirituality, sometimes the word spirituality itself, is used in terms of purpose, in terms of calling, uh, and in terms of character in that one. I've also seen it used in terms of um, well, in terms of energy, actually, there's a, there's a little book, a kind of a management, business and management book, I can't remember if it's by now, Schwartz and Loeb, or something like The Power of Something Engagement, or something like that. But they use a kind of energetic economic model, and one of the kind of energies, if you like, that you bring to business and economics is... Uh, spiritual energy, which again is a bit like purpose, I suppose, in that, but they talk about it in terms of an energetics. So there's something about, about energy within spirituality. There's also, I think, something to do with force and power, uh, quite literally in terms of the religious uh, domain that I've talked about, when we talk about a higher, uh, a higher power, but also uh, I think that's also applied in other, time, in other kind of terms. You know, it's, it's, if you say a person has spirit, it means they have power or they have force of some kind. Uh, and I've seen that applied in, in sports particularly, actually. Because uh, there's quite some quite interesting research going on to do with correlations between excellence in sporting achievements 
on something that might probably be called spirituality, which sometimes means religious faith and sometimes means these other things I've talked about, character, calling, will, uh, and uh, something like energy, force. I've also heard it talked about a lot, and this is uh, something that Andrew Newberg, for example, talks a bit about, uh, about spirituality being used very, in very close combination to terms like consciousness. So consciousness itself is portrayed as something very close to spiritual. It has something of the gloss of those other understandings of spiritual that I've already talked about. And so consciousness is seen as a kind of spiritual phenomenon. Those are the ones that are jumping at me right now, and there's probably others. Uh, and I'm just thinking, you know, what, what is the, well, surface, what's the connection between these things? What do they have in common? Uh, and what can we say about them? Well, the first thing I think to say about them is that um, I think like a lot of terms that have those kind of overlaps, they'll, they'll tend to, I think, we should probably find them uh, acquiring a kind of repertoire of those ideas when they're used in different contexts. So I'd be surprised if uh, spirituality applied to religious practice didn't have something of energetics to it. And I think it does. I think there is something about energy in, um, in spiritual understandings and, and things like consciousness. And I think we do think about, well, very consciously, there are um, uh, references to consciousness, higher consciousness, big mind, all those kind of terms are used in very sp uh, very religious contexts. Uh, yeah, so the first, so, the, so the, the, they are kind of bleeding into each other, those various different features of spirituality. The second thing is that I, th I think I would expect to see a set of common metaphors being used. And I think something like spirituality, and particularly the terms that I've just uh, kind of narrated about, you know, what kinds of things spirituality is applied to, they're all pretty abstract concepts. You know, that, what is purpose? And how do you see purpose? How do you touch and feel purpose? Well, you don't. So we have to imagine it by the application of some kind of conceptual metaphor. Similarly with calling, similarly with character, similarly with consciousness, similarly with energy, actually. I know energy has a very particular meaning in uh, scientific and rational situations, something like the ability to do work or something. But even then, I think we do imagine it through the application of a conceptual metaphor. We, we use other means when we're doing the maths, but when we're not doing the maths, when we're talking about it, even, uh, even energy in a scientific sense, we talk about it as if it was a kind of well, as if it was something else. We talk about the application of metaphor. And I think the dominant metaphor for uh, spirituality is a substance metaphor. Uh, and I think, it, I think the kind of substance it is is a kind of... Uh, well, it's either a gas or it's uh, a low boiling point liquid, something like ether or methylated spirits, that kind of thing. That's, I know it sounds mad, but that's kind of how I'm imagining it. And I think that's how I'm imagining it non-consciously and that non-conscious imagination of methylated spirits evaporating and rising and being the source of energy and, uh, and being quite hard to grasp and those kind of things. I think that's what's happening behind the scenes of my, um, my wide awake language. I think my non-conscious processing is absolutely going through some kind of, uh, some kind of imaginative process involving something like methylated spirits or some other volatile liquid. And as I say, all the, if, there, if there's any truth in that, and I don't, there may well not be, if, uh, if we do imagine spirituality in all of those contexts as something like a volatile liquid, then we should see it coming up as an entailment of the language. And I think we do, even when you're talking about something like electricity. And electricity is a, an energy it's a uh, you know, absolutely solid. Um, no, nothing strange about that. It's just science. But we talk about electricity as if it was a liquid. We talk about it flowing through circuits. We talk about there being a current. You know, old radio sets had valves in them, for God's sake. 
So uh, we talk about and about electricity uh, kind of as if it was a a liquid, albeit a liquid that can uh, that has very dangerous properties. Uh, yeah, and, and and things like soul, we imagine it kind of volatilizing at the point of death. I think I mean the actual the the kind of uh, mythological journey of the soul out of the body at death. Uh, like in that song from Norman Greenbaum, Now Lay Me Down to Die, going up to the spirit in the sky, it's almost as if this, this liquid that's either, it's in the body somehow, this volatile liquid, this methylated spirit, is, uh, is volatilizing away and rising into the atmosphere to join the, uh, the big pool of volatile gas, I suppose, in the, uh, in, in, in the big mind up there, really. <laughs>